Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, is a real familiar passage of Scripture. It says in verse 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Jesus quoted this verse. It's used many times in the New Testament, and everybody's familiar with this 18th verse. But look at the context of it. Look at verse 17. It says, Thou shalt not hate thy neighbor in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. This is saying that if you don't rebuke your neighbor, again, there's a right and a wrong way to do this, but if you don't tell them the truth, if you don't take the word, the revelation, the truth that God has given you and share it with your neighbor, the scripture says you hate him. And there's people that say, well, no, I don't hate them. I pray for them all the time. Let me say it this way. What it is, you love yourself more than you love that other person because you don't want to suffer the criticism. You don't want to suffer the potential rejection. You don't want them to call you a fanatic or whatever. And so you will literally not speak the truth that God has shown you because you don't want their rejection. And what that means is you love yourself. And this says that you have to tell a person the truth, rebuke him, and not suffer sin upon him. Now, again, you can't force a person to respond, but you should at least give them the privilege of hearing the truth. You know, I was an introvert when I was young. I couldn't look at a person in the face and talk to them. And even though I've come a long ways, nobody likes rejection. I don't like rejection. If you like rejection, something's wrong with you. God made us for acceptance. There's something inside of every person that would just love to have everybody love us. So you shouldn't like rejection, and I don't like rejection, but the Lord spoke to me one time when I was talking to a guy, and he was sharing his problem, and the Lord showed me what was wrong, and I could tell him what was wrong and tell him how to get free, but I knew he wasn't going to like it. I knew he wasn't going to like what I said. And so I was sitting here debating about it, and the Lord just spoke to me, and he says, if you don't tell him the truth, then you rejected the truth for him. You didn't even give him the privilege of rejecting the truth on his own. And you know, when I saw that, that has changed the way I deal with things. Now I'm going to tell a person the truth, and they may or may not accept it. And I'm not saying that everybody's going to love what you've got to say, but you know what? You ought to give every person the honor of rejecting the truth on their own instead of you rejecting it without even giving them a chance. And when we fail to speak the truth because we are afraid that they might not like it, you have rejected the truth for them. And you can't get free without the truth. It's the truth that you know that makes you free. Brothers and sisters, it's, it's just wrong. It's wrong the way that the church has been silent, the way that we have not been speaking up. And I can guarantee you there are people out there all week long. You're going to pass people that are just dying for somebody to share the truth with them. They're praying for help. And they don't know where it's, where, how to get it. They don't know where to go. A lot of people have rejected religion. They hadn't rejected God. They've rejected religion, which I've rejected religion too. They're upset with the people who represent God. But people are hungry. And we need to share these truths with them. You know, I live in Florissant, and, and I have to drive up Highway 24 through the pass. And about 20 years ago, or so ago, I was driving on a real dark night and I was going up that road and it's it's a 55 mile an hour uh, speed limit on it and um, anyway it was foggy it was dark and this car passed me going like 50 60 miles an hour and just I mean you could only see just a short ways and right after it passed me I saw the brake lights come on and this car just jerked to the right and I could tell something happened so I slammed on my brakes and I came to rest on the shoulder and he was in the right lane, and in the left lane, there was a horse. And he had hit this horse, and it had caved in his windshield, and he was laying there, and he had blood all over him and stuff. So I was looking at all of this, and while I was trying to help him, a Suburban came around the corner about 60 miles an hour and hit that horse. 
and it launched this car in the air, five or 10 feet in the air, maybe 20 feet uh, long, and this woman was able to regain control and pulled off to the side of the road, and I went up there, and she had knocked a hole or a bump in the top of her uh, car where her head had hit it, and there was other cars coming around the corner, and I could tell that this was going to be bad, and so I ran down the road around the corner Nobody could see where the wreck was, and I started jumping out in front of cars. And this is in the dark. There was fog, and you could just barely see me. And I mean, I was having to jump out of the way of these cars going 50 and 60 miles an hour, and people were squealing their brakes and sliding to the side of the road. People yelled at me, cussed me, waved at me with one finger. <laughs> there were some terrible things that were said. But you know what? When they got around the corner and saw this wreck, I bet you some of those people who cursed me went to thanking me. Nobody ever came back and said anything. Nobody helped me. And I stayed there for over 30 minutes until the police showed up. There's probably 100 cars that I flagged now. <clears throat> and you know what? If you really love people, you will sit there and suffer possible rejection, criticism, if you know that they're going to die. This is going to kill them. And a person who says, well, man, what if there was a single woman driving up there in the dark of the night and she sees some man jumping out in front of her car and trying to flag her down? That could scare her. That could offend her. Uh, I would never do that. So you just let them go and let them die. And that's love? That's not love. You know, Pastor Mark would never preach to you the way I am. That's the reason I'm an evangelist. I travel. I couldn't have a church. If I had a church, I'd drive everybody off. <laughs> but I'm telling you the truth, and I'm doing it in love, and he'll get up and soothe your wounds later on. But I'm just telling you that, brothers and sisters, we just love ourselves is what it is. And the reason you aren't speaking up, and the reason that you have people that you work with that don't even know you believe in healing, that don't even know you go to church, that don't even know you are born again, that don't even know your stand on political things. I can guarantee you they're talking about it all the time. They have no fear. They don't mind talking about it. But there's people that you know that would be shocked to find out what you believe. That's wrong. That's wrong. You've got to speak the truth. You are God's messenger. You are his mouthpiece. If Elijah hadn't have stood up to the king and spoken this, even if the drought came, they would have just written it off as, well, it's just a cycle. It's just something that happened. This is natural. They it wouldn't have made the difference. But because he spoke the word, it catapulted him to a place of leadership in that nation, and he called all of the nation together, and he challenged them to a duel. And he called fire down out of heaven that consumed the sacrifice. And the entire nation fell on its face saying, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. I can guarantee you the same thing would happen today if just this many people, I don't know how many we have in here, but a thousand or whatever. If a thousand people went out and every one of you stood up when you heard people talking poverty, sickness, depression, grief, immorality, politics, and if you just stood up and inserted the Word of God, I can guarantee it would cause a revival of epidemic proportions if people would stand up and speak the Word. But there is a spirit of Antichrist at work in this world. We call it political correctness. But it is a demonic spirit. There's not, a, there's not political correctness against Muslims, against Buddhists, they just started a Satanist club in schools. And you know what? The schools are embracing that because, after all, we've got to embrace diversity. But they'll fight against Bibles. They'll fight against Christians doing things. There is a spirit of Antichrist. It's demonic. And any time that you're cowed by this political correctness, you are giving place to a spirit of Antichrist. And as Mark said earlier, we, the church is the most powerful influence on the planet. The Word of God is so powerful. In the end times, He's going to come back and a sharp two-edged sword is going to come out of Jesus' mouth. 
And, you know, I believe that that's talking about symbolic. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says. He's just going to speak the Word out of his mouth, and the blood will flow up to the horse's bridle, three to four feet high for 120 miles. We've got those same words, but it has to be spoken in faith. It can't be spoken apologetically. We need to stand up and speak the truth. When people go to talking about homosexuality and stuff, there's a tendency for us to cow and to fear and stuff, and we, we shouldn't. It ought to be them that feel weird. <coughs> I'm not against homosexuals. I, I love them. I preach to them. I've had people on my staff that struggled with homosexuality, and I didn't fire them. They're still with me. They've been with me over a decade, and I love them, and I deal with them. But you know what? I don't support it. It's wrong. It's killing people. Did you know that homosexuality, this is according to the gay and lesbians' own website, takes an average of 21 years off of a homosexual's life. They die 21 years earlier than their heterosexual counterparts. Smoking takes an average of seven years off of a person's life, and yet they put a warning on every pack of cigarettes saying this could be hazardous to your health. If we weren't hypocrites, if we weren't afraid of political correctness, we ought to put a sticker on every homosexual's forehead that this could be hazardous to your health. I'm not against homosexuals. I love them, and because I love them, I'll tell you the truth, that God made them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Man, we, it is wrong, and it's bad for you. Spousal abuse among homosexuals is like, uh, I forget the exact things, but it's like 30 times what it is among men. And among lesbians, the spousal abuse, when they get into a lesbian relationship, is like 300 times greater than it is among heterosexuals. If you weren't hypocrites, if we were just going to be honest, we would do something about that. The suicide rate is three times greater for homosexuals. And yet some people are wanting to take sodas out of the public school system and change things because it might cause a little bit of weight or something, and we're willing to let government intervene in that, but nobody will say anything about homosexuality. I love the people, and I love them enough, I'm going to tell them the truth. Thank you for those couple of amens. <laughs> I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we, we have the truth. We're praying, oh, God, move. God is praying, would one of you move? Would one of you stand up and say something? Would one of you just... God will confirm the word that we speak with signs and wonders following, is what it says in Mark chapter 16. But if you don't speak it, God can't confirm what you hadn't spoken. You need to stand up and go to speaking the word. We need to be bold. And somebody says, but this could cost me my job. Man, your job's not your source. God is your source. I, I ministered along these lines in the first service, and I had a man come up who was a, I forgot his exact position, but he worked in the fire department, and because of his witness, he says he tells everybody about the Lord that it potentially could have cost him his job. And anyway, the long story is he's now working at uh, the Air Force Base, and he's been promoted, and God honored him and promoted him. His immediate boss didn't like it, but others have accepted it, and God promoted him. God will promote you. God will take care of you. And like the Hebrew children said, even if he doesn't, we still aren't going to bow down and worship your God. Even if God didn't take care of me, I'm going to still speak the truth because someday I'm going to stand before God. Brothers and sisters, I'm saying all of these things that we need to break the silence, and yes, we need to break the silence in the realm of politics. We need to start doing that, but you need to break the silence in your own home, in your own family, in your own neighborhood, in your own work situation. We've got to start speaking the word. You can't departmentalize it and just say, all right, I'm going to get involved and support this candidate and help them run. No, you need to get in and start standing for the Lord. You know, I travel all over the world, and I go through interpreters a lot, and I've had interpreters that didn't like what I was saying. It didn't fit their theology, and so they would just change it, and they would make me say all kinds of things. 
And boy, that's frustrating when I'm trying to communicate with people and yet my interpreter is saying something different than what I'm saying. Boy, it's frustrating. And I remember one time I just looked at the guy and I said, say it the way I say it. You aren't interpreting for yourself. You're interpreting for me. Say what I say. And I can just hear the Lord saying that that's what he's saying to us. God's Word has made it very clear what His standards are and what things should be, and yet His people are thinking, oh, that's outdated, or oh, this is too harsh, or oh, uh, they might not like this, and so we water it down. I can just hear the Lord saying, you aren't interpreting for yourself. You're interpreting for Him. You're His mouthpiece. We're supposed to be representing Him. We are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador doesn't go to a country and say what he wants to say. He says what God or what his government tells him to say. We're supposed to be saying what God tells us to say. So brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you that here's an example in the Word of God of a man who faced possible death, but he boldly stood up and proclaim the word of the Lord, and because of it, God promoted him. This same man in 2 Kings chapter 2 was translated into heaven and never died. And you know, one of the reasons is because he honored the Lord. He stood up. He spoke the word of God. He put his life on the line. Most of us would love to have the results, but we aren't willing to do what he did. We've got words from God. You've got a better opinion of God than the people that don't know Him. And you shouldn't let them rule the conversation. You ought to take control and say, that's my father you're talking about. I know him personally. Have you ever read the Bible? How can you criticize it if you haven't read it? I've read it. And then you become the authority and you start speaking on it. And if we would do that, brothers and sisters, I guarantee you, you would have revival. You'd have a revival or a riot, one of the two. <laughs> and ultimately, it would work out for good. Yes. Amen. Yes. So praise God. We need to just get bold. Father, I speak these things to my brothers and sisters in the name of the Lord, and I'm asking you, the Holy Spirit, that you would take these things and burn it into people's hearts, that they would recognize, Father, that we need to break the silence in our own personal lives, in every area of our life. Father, forgive us for not honoring you and not loving you and other people more than we love ourselves, and we just make a decision today to put you first, and we receive all of the instruction that's coming this week and believe that it's going to help us to start making a difference. Father, we believe that there's a revival going to take place right here in Colorado Springs as people go out and just begin to start speaking the truth that people will be set free. And Father, we thank you for it. We agree and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Pastor Mark. Amen. Amen. Oh, wow. That was a mouthful. It was a lot going on there. And um, I know that it's been, uh, it's been a while. These messages, Andrew preaches them in different settings, and it's the same kind of message. And mm -hmm. it's, it's really, he has a book called The Believer's Authority, and a lot of different of parts of what he teaches all really are couched in the same framework of what it is and what it means to be the salt on the earth. If you lose your flavor, if you lose your taste, what good is it? It's useless. I mean, that's really where our essence is. If we have God in us, if we are one with Christ, What'd you think, Clint? How'd you like it? <laughs> I know it crossed some barriers for you in many different areas. Uh, probably, it's um, probably well, some pro and some not so pro. <laughs> well, no, I, uh, I'm right online. Sperry and, and Geraldine. My name's Clint Fleming. Um, I'm a former firefighter paramedic. I was born and raised in uh, Palm Beach County, uh, Lake Worth, Florida. Um, and I uh, understand I lost my job because of my faith. That was God ordained. It's a whole other story. Um, but God moved my wife and I to Greenville, South Carolina, where we've resided now for 15 years. 
And um, if I may, Kurt, just Jeez. briefly, um, I know exactly what, what uh, Andrew's talking about. Um, I met Kurt uh, after pursuing, um, God woke me up one early morning, watched this guy on a TV program, and I chased Kurt down because I could see the Holy Spirit moving in him. <laughs> and, and we became online friends, what, a few years ago. Yeah. Um, haven't haven't been in though. touch. Yeah, it's been a while. We haven't got, we haven't been able to get, be in touch frequently. Um, but we have kindred spirits and I've, uh, had a ministry now for several years called responding to the call. And the, the, the mission of responding to the call is to take Christians who have fallen, been lulled asleep by complacency, apathy, uh, and mediocrity within the institutional church mm -hmm. to wake them up and train them, mentor them to be kingdom responders so that they will be available to fulfill the Great Commission and respond in their communities to resuscitate man's heart uh, to God. So what Andrew's talking about has been in the prophetic for a number of years and prophets have received this message. So this message is not foreign to me. Um, uh, and we know in James chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, God explicit, or James explicitly describes the responsibility of the believer, is to go and be doers of the word, not just hearers only. And that's how people know that Christ is alive. But Christians are stuck in spiritual strongholds, Anger, guilt, shame, unforgiveness, pride, whatever issues may be inhibiting them from moving, and religiosity, okay, from moving beyond complacency into a position of responsibility. And, you know, salvation is just the stepping stone. Uh, we have to move beyond this. We're not being, the, the institutional church at large is not discipling. And people don't understand their responsibility. But if they're leaving it up to the local pastor or local body at the building down the street, which doesn't identify the church, it's the body of Christ, then they're, they're neglecting the responsibility that's something that Andrew hit on. You can't go before God and claim uh, ignorance. That's right. You can't. We have a responsibility. He called us to be his ambassadors. And we, each one of us has been ordained. And, and Kurt and I were talking about this before he came online. But we each have been called through the commission that Christ provided us. He, he has released, um, released the responsibility of ministry to his people. And once we have begun through the process of transformation, getting out of these strongholds, sanctification begins, fulfillment begins, and we understand our identity in the Father as bond slaves. Bond slaves who have given up the rights to ourselves, given up the rights to lead on our own understanding. And through that, Christ really commissions us, and he um, delegates the authority through the order of Melchizedek what was bestowed upon him to us. Amen. We, we have this whole idea of a role and, and, and a role that we have comes <laughs> along with it responsibilities. And, 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 and really the idea of turning a blind eye and what's something that Andrew just was saying earlier is, is really a hatred it, it's not a love. It, it's not really expressing love. And it, Jesus is that role model of love. And we are supposed to as well carry that, you know, role in that position. As love, there really shouldn't even be anything inhibiting us. It really. It, right. it should be any, there should be such clarity and such favor. Hey, David, I just noticed we have a new visitor. David, how are you? Can you, can you, you're on mute. Let me unmute you. Hold on. You have a way of unmuting yourself. Hold on. You know, let me unmute Dave. Hey Dave, how are you? Well, I'm embarrassed since I messed up on the time. Oh, okay. That's fine. I'm glad you made it anyway. This is, um, we have, <clears throat> it, we usually take the beginning part of the meeting 
to um, do like intros. And unfortunately, we ran a little late for one because Clint and I were gabbing <laughs> before the meeting started. And then we had a technical failure halfway through the meeting the first time ever. I'm on location. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, Florida, where there's hardly any internet. And all of a sudden it died. So we've been dealing with technical issues today. So it was a good thing. And David, if you'd like, actually, being that we're here, usually I let these meetings go an hour because they're respecting everybody's time. So really from 7 to 8, and then at 8 o'clock, I pretty much shut down the recording, capsulate it, and I keep an archive. All of these meetings will be available on archive on the KurtBreddle.com website. So you can see every teaching we've ever had on every day in its entirety. But to just give you an, an update, we just watched um, this, this meeting here on this night, uh, which is Thursday nights, is for world issues and then our roles and responsibilities basically as Christians and how we are to engage, how we are to influence and the things that we're called to do. And Clint was just explaining his ministry. He's ministry for his first responders. It's responding to the call and it's all kinds of hyperbole there. It's a great ministry. It's got all kinds of great things going for it. And we've been friends for years and years now with uh, just through the testimony of Andrew Womack. Jerry, I met for the first time through Andrew Omag's teaching. Um, Sperry, I met also. He was through, um, he's a minister and he's also right now working on just joining us and getting started with some of the healing testimonies and different things that we have. So I know, David, I think I, I found your information. Did you come in through Andrew Womack's Karis Bible Studies? Yeah, I did. I think I had... Uh sent your wife a couple of notes because one of the things we graduated a year ago, May from second year, okay. graduated third year this last May. Okay. And while we were doing third year, we were in Dallas. We had an excellent Carrots Bible Studies group. I got you. But uh, that's a hundred miles from here. So I've moved back to my home. When we were still in Colorado, the guy that originally set all this up said uh, that he was going to figure out how to do how the Paris Bible studies online, and then he's going to share it with everybody else, and that sort of fell in the crack somewhere. So I'm very curious. You seem to have figured out the technical part of it. Oh, yeah. Well, he, we figured it out all right. You can. Uh, Jerry's laughing in the background because. This has been a tough road to hoe, if I were to say myself. <laughs> but we've been through the ups and downs. And today, actually, and be honest, Jerry, it's been pretty perfect for the past couple it of weeks. It has been. Today, they, it the, is perfect. It's an awesome group. And today was the never first. Never missed. <laughs> well, we know. Roger, Roger Williams, the guy that's running the Karis Bible Study. I you know, know, Roger. Once you, if you have actually broken the code and you have another successful month, I was talking to Roger the other day. He'd love to know what you're doing and pass it out to other people. Let me tell you something about Roger. Him and I try to communicate, but unfortunately, I think Roger has to realize that when you communicate with someone, it's two ways. It's not just me talking and waiting for you to answer me whenever you get a chance. <laughs> So I kind of uh, like let that one just go. <laughs> go I, I've got I've got the same issues. <laughs> yeah, it's like well, I guess uh, Kurt, I'm I'm lurking because this topic fascinates me with everything that's going on with politics. Yeah, I'll check in on one of your Karis Bible study nights also, but I was mainly interested to see that you'd gotten everything figured out. Well, you know. That's what I was told once, and I and I, when I thought I did, I, I realized I didn't. <laughs> I don't have nowhere near everything figured out, but thank God for this. We got through these hurdles. And, uh, he worked very, very hard, and he worked very hard for a long time to get this the way it is, and it is perfect, but he stayed with it until he got it like this. It didn't just happen overnight. <laughs> Well, I think I've been here yeah. since the first class, actually. So, well, um, are you talking specifically about this Zoom setup and how you can interact, or are you talking about something else? Well, well the, Zoom seems to be working. We've had people 
I know that tried to use Google Plus meetups that tried to use a couple of other things. Nobody wants to pay the money for go to webinar and that's primarily a one directional thing. Yeah. <laughs> so if Kurt has figured out something that's not 500 a month, that's a huge step forward for everybody that's interested in such a thing. Well, I'm glad you mentioned it because Clint was actually asking me about it. And that's one of the reasons he joined us tonight, too, because he has a ministry of his own. He's been working through some things. And, and the thing about this is, as I failed to realize that I did step up to a premium level. It's a small fee. I think it's like twenty nine dollars a month. But and even with that, that's because I can go up to 40 people. I think the original free one works exactly the same, but it's limited to a handful you know, of people. Well, that, that's wow. a screaming bargain. The people, yeah. I told the people before I left Dallas that I was going to look around and try to figure out how to do what you're doing, and then we might try to have another Bible study. Plus, I'm in a location now, now that I'm back home, that I can't even scare up a group here. So doing one online might be great. Yeah, definitely. Oh, you're trying to take our secrets and take them to a different class. We're not well, passing um, out our secrets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the yeah. good one's got plenty of candidates. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm gonna say, out. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that my daughter, I first saw this Zoom about a couple months ago because my daughter does some stuff, and she contacted me through it but I didn't know anything about it. And then when I hooked up with Kurt a few days ago, I, I thought I had to sign up to get my name to show up. So I ended up making an account. But if I read it right, I think the free one is allowing 50 people now. There's some old information on the internet that says 25. Right. I think, I, think, I, I think it's 50 people for the free one. Yeah, I think you're right. Because I had, when I first started the setup, I was looking for 100 people. Because when I first put in an online Bible study, I have 50, more than 50 names and email addresses of people that just went through Karis Bible studies through Andrew's ministry to do online. But unfortunately, I'll get like two and then four and then they're gone and they're here a week and then gone a week. And very few people, and I, Clint and I were talking about it, about faithful men and women is who you're going to disciple. They're going to be faithful because they are really have that faithfulness in them but the thing is that which if you looked at it you could start off with hangouts and i think it's seven people with hangouts that you can get up to seven but the thing is is that as the thing goes further and deeper and bigger eventually you're gonna have to step up and pay and get to something yeah. that has more and the the really the reason why i like this one and i've tried cisco I was on with them. I was on with with um, freeteleconference.com, which is the one, incidentally, that um, Karis Bible Studies, what's his name again? I just forgot his name. Um, yeah, he, he told me to try that one, that people were having success with it. But the latency, you see, right now, we just had a group talk, and everyone was talking at the same time. And you can hear everyone, like if we're sitting in the room at the same time. You can't do that with anyone other than this one that I've noticed anyway, because it, it is actually the, it works and responds like a real live conversation, like a whole town hall meeting. It's like, and, and that's what I liked about it. And then the second thing was with Cisco, who I think is like the world leader in technology, they could not get my videos to play when I shared my screen. In other words, the audio. I had to go through all kinds of technological changes just to get the audio to work whenever I played a YouTube video or a teaching. And that was the biggest deal for me because I knew I was going to set this environment up like a CBC satellite school where I wanted to have the, to be able to have the videos, the syllabus, and just watch them and then discuss them. That's what my goal was. And none of the platforms really had a good sound way to do that except for this one. So this is so far work and knock on wood or whatever you want to knock on. <clears throat> that's how I found it to work the best. And like you see, can you see this screen? You can't see anything on my screen right now. Can you hold on? Oh, no, I see. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Yeah. 
Okay. Now you can see Andrew and share the screen. You know, and, and these are the way this is the way that the um the, the that it allows you to do all this stuff where I can search and I can and talk and look up scripture and point out different things as I need to. And and that's really where I found the best um interaction was with this software. So what? that's pretty much, you know, again, everything about what and and what I'm gonna do is just give me a second here. I'm gonna stop the recording because I'm I don't wanna have to record all this stuff we're talking about. Mm -hmm.